Good morning. Uh, thank you for, I know that there's a number of people online and I think that we're still getting folks trickling in related to some parking difficulties this morning. So thank you for being with us this morning. I'm Steve Bradley. It's uh, my pleasure to welcome Jan Richardson and Emily Downing for our kickoff to um, our CV work in serious illness conversations. I'd first like to thank uh, Beringer Engelheim for supporting our Grand Rounds this morning. Um, by way of introduction, um, those who don't know me, I think you probably all do. Steve Bradley, I'm a general cardiologist and uh, Jan Emily and um, uh, Glenn Varnes reached out to us to ask uh, the Healthcare Delivery Innovation Center and myself and Craig Strauss about how they could work with us and partner with us to bring this work to the cardiovascular service line uh, is in serious illness conversations. And so this is our kickoff to that uh, integration of MHI and the cardiovascular service line in serious illness conversations. Um, our speakers today, Jan Richardson and Emily Downing. Jan Richardson's an internist and she's worked both in the hospital and the clinic at Bandana Square for 20 years. She's now the physician lead for the Serious Illness Care Program. She's a graduate of the University of Colorado and completed a residency at the University of Minnesota. Chicago, what did I say? Oh, well, geez, I skipped, yeah, I skipped over. Yeah, Chicago, thank you. So, and then Emily Downing is a internist and geriatrician. She serves as the system clinical officer for population health, home care services and health equity for Alina Health. Dr. Downing is a graduate of the University of Minnesota Medical School and completed her residency in internal medicine geriatrics fellowship at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. Passionate a bit about population uh, health care for seniors and delivering care in the home wherever possible. Um, so thank you both for being here today. Thank you all for being here. And today they'll be presenting on the Serious Illness Conversation Program. I'll serve as a bit of a mediator discussing some of these components and how they um, apply to cardiovascular care to try and help think about um, integrating this work. And thank you to both, welcome. Is it on? Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you for having us. I'm Jan Richardson, and we will get started. Let me just say, um, as um, Dr. Bradley said, I'm a primary care doc. And uh, when I discovered this work, it may sound kind of weird, serious illness conversations, what in the world is that? But when I discovered this five years or so ago, um, this changed the way I practice medicine. Not, not just for my seriously ill patients, it changed the way I talked with all of my patients. And I would say, I, to sum it up, what, as one of my colleagues said, sort of beginning to use this guide it, and and learning, learning about talking with our seriously ill patients, um, she said it reminded her of why we went into medicine. Um, just sharing what we know about a, a patient's disease trajectory and then just simply asking them what is most important in light of that. So no um, disclosures other than to just credit Ariadne Labs, a research group at Harvard who has developed, developed the Serious Illness Conversation Guide and a lot of the materials that they are willing to freely share with anyone in the world, and they do. Our objectives this morning are to just talk a little bit about prognosis and how we communicate that to a patient. And I think Emily's gonna um, share maybe a slightly different perspective on how to do that. How to identify our seriously ill patients, which sounds obvious, but isn't always so obvious. And then to make sure that you know how to find our one point source of truth in the chart now about um, patients' goals and preferences. So we'll just give you a quick overview of our serious illness care program, the guide itself, the new filter in the, in the uh, electronic medical record, and then how to document these conversations. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Dr. Bradley for a few minutes. Thanks, Jan. Um, so I think when we start thinking about what, what a serious illness conversation was this all about, it's helpful to think about who we're seeing in, the, in clinic, who we're seeing in the hospital, what our, patient, what our patients are looking like as we continue to advance and the complexity um, and innovations that we can provide in care delivery that also means that we have patients who are living longer with a greater burden of illness. And it can be increasingly challenging to inform and make sure that the patient is informed about their overall big picture and their trajectory of care. 
Um, and as clinicians, oftentimes as a result, we feel trapped between the pressure of what we can offer, but being uncertain about what a patient truly wants and what their goals of care are. And as a result, that can lead to frustration and misunderstanding, both from the provider standpoint of what is it that I really should be offering this patient? And how should I be making sure that they're, they're engaged and informed about what their options are? And a patient about really feeling that they, are, they understand what's happening in their care and where they're, where they're going forward with. So that leads to questions about what, what, why didn't anyone tell me? And what, if I'd only known, perhaps I would have chosen differently about what my treatment options are. So with that, I'll present a case um, to help us think through what these, these conversations might be about. 72-year-old retired salesperson, EF of 15%, comorbidities of diabetes, osteoarthritis, and obesity, uh, just recently referred for home oxygen, two hospitalizations this year for heart failure exacerbation, not a candidate for advanced heart failure therapies. They need help with their activities of daily living, including shopping, and they have difficulty walking two city blocks. The patient's married and lives with their husband, um, and adult children do not live locally. Uh, the prognosis at this point is felt to be less than one year, but death could be sudden and without warning. What are th thoughts about that prognosis? Do people agree with that prognosis for this patient? I'll flip back again to a 72-year-old with an EF of 15%, not a candidate for advanced heart failure therapies. I'm seeing some nodding. So there's a general consensus that this patient has a, a serious illness and their, their long-term pro, uh, prognosis is poor. What do you expect their medical course to be over the coming year? They've been hospitalized twice in the past year. Quite likely that this patient would be hospitalized again. And so understanding that, if, um, I think the question becomes, what would help the patient most at this time in terms of understanding? I think one of the challenges is that um, we sometimes fail to use that opportunity of having patients experience these events to have conversations about what that means about um, what we've learned from their past history and what that means about where they could be going forward. So with that, what is a serious illness? Uh, what is serious illness communication? It's conversations about the expected course of serious illness and a patient's goals, values, and priorities that can inform treatment decisions. So in this patient that we, we discussed, this 72-year-old, they've had multiple hospitalizations, they're not a candidate for advanced heart failure therapies, and having a conversation about their expected course of their serious illness can help understand what are their goals, what are their values, what's important to them as we look to achieve care that's consistent and concordant with their goals of care. This type of advanced care planning is not about code status. This is not about filling out a post. This is about better understanding um, where, they, where, they, where they intend to receive their care, what's important to them as they continue to move forward, um, and not necessarily an end-of-life discussion. Um, Dan and Emily, was there anything you'd add to kind of that general concept of what a serious illness communication conversation is about? Yeah, I might just add, and it, I think it a warrants seconding, that the serious illness conversation isn't saying there isn't anything left to do for you. Um, a lot of clinicians fear that, and this conversation is the start of what is yet to come. Um, and having that open dialogue with your patients to understand what they want so that when you may get to a point where you're talking about those topics where you really think there isn't anything that there might not be or you really want to talk about something like hospice, you've had this precursor conversation with your patient so that you're aligned and you understand their goals. So um, part of the intent of having this this introduction to serious illness conversations is to help us move these conversations further upstream. And so if we think about advanced care planning, it's about um, moving further and further upstream from uh, avoiding the lights and sirens discussion of a patient who's at the end of their life and, and really having the very um, kind of end discussions about what's important to them as they're at, at their terminal stage and more about this is a patient who, within the next year, we expect that they likely would be hospitalized again and what's consistent with their goals and how do we make sure that the care that we provide is consistent with what they would want. Um, over time, I think it's important to patients will oftentimes, as we know with chronic illnesses, there's peaks and valleys in terms of how pro they progress. And so they see themselves recover to a, to a peak and it's important to help them understand that that peak isn't necessarily the overall trajectory. The overall trajectory of someone with a serious illness is that continuous downward trend. This is an opportunity to have a conversation when they are feeling better about what's important to them when they have another decompensation in their serious illness over time. Anything that you would add to that, Jan or Emily? Thank you. 
So why is this important for patients? Certainly, it gives them an opportunity to plan. Instead of in that lights and sirens moment, this gives them an opportunity to think through what's important to them, what's concordant with their goals and priority. It helps them achieve better quality of life, making sure that the care we provide is consistent with their goals. And then it has implications in terms of hospitalizations and costs. So if patients um, indicate that they are not interested in further hospitalizations or further advanced therapies or invasive therapies, it can be helpful to have those conversations so we avoid hospitalizations and procedures that aren't consistent with their goals of care. And currently in our country, the vast majority of hospital, uh, hospitalizations occur, in, uh, a vast majority of patients uh, have a hospitalization in their last 90 days of life, and the vast majority of patients don't want that in their last days of life. So having these conversations earlier allows us to ensure that the goals of care are outlined and that our care is concordant with what they want. So why is this relevant to cardiologists? So um, <laughs> I have the pleasure of, of presenting slides that uh, Jan and Emily have put together. So I'll say uh, when we tolerate poor uh, end-of-life care, I, I won't say that, I'll, that we tolerate it, but I think there's an opportunity for us to do better to make sure that our care is aligned with our patients' goals and priorities. Um, and this is a, an area where I talk about sometimes poor measures leading to good efforts. So I think we have a poor measure in that we measure in-hospital mortality, and one of the ways that we account for in-hospital mortality is all patients who die. But patients who are DNAR when they come into the hospital don't fall into the, the denominator. So you can improve your in-hospital mortality by having more patients who are DNAR. Now, I think that's a poor measure, but it speaks to important care delivery, right? It's important for us to have these conversations about goals of care and making sure that patients who do not want these advanced therapies, who do not want to come back into the hospital, who want to be um, cared for in terms of uh, their goals aren't to be in the hospital and that they would not want to be resuscitated, that we have those conversations so they document it and so that we achieve that measure by providing good care. This is an Align Equality Initiative for 20, uh, 21 and beyond, so this is for hospitalists, primary care providers, and oncologists. Now it's an opportunity for cardiology to be involved in this care, this uh, this work as well. Maybe I can just uh, qualify a few things. And Steve, you're doing a great job on these slides that uh, Jan and I prepared. Um, so when we say we, we tolerate poor end-of-life care, it's more our global we of our healthcare system. And really that, and, and maybe this is just our perception, but that, um, good high quality conversations really focusing on planning with each patient every time who we think is entering end of life isn't a consistent practice yet. It's, um, it's maybe seen as a secondary or a choice to, continue to, to do that. And that's why we call it a quality issue because it really should be a consistent part of care for every patient every time and we're just not there yet. So it's not specific to cardiologists, it's just us as a healthcare system. And I think one of the, the challenges is sometimes as a, subspecial, as a specialist or subspecialist in clinic or in the hospital, we oftentimes um, may reflect that this is, the, this is the role of the primary provider. So either the hospitalist in the inpatient service or the primary care provider in the outpatient clinic. But I think it's important that those hospitalists and primary care providers often turn to the specialist or subspecialist to provide guidance in terms of what the prognosis is. They may not have the same degree of insight and knowledge about what it means to have end-stage heart failure or to have untreatable valve disease or um, severe ischemic heart disease, so on and so forth. And so it's important to include the consultant. It's important for the con consultant to be involved in these conversations. And the conversation is at the heart of, the, of all informed decision making. So oftentimes, we as the specialists are providing guidance in, in uh, conversations about therapy options and procedures. And it's important that we have these conversations as well to ensure that the therapy we're offering is con consistent with their goals of care. We're all part of the continuum of care, and it takes many conversations. And um, one of the key components is there's not enough palliative care do doctors to provide this care. Um, when I was at the University of Colorado in the VA, I worked closely with a, with a palliative care doctor whose entire work of research was around creating the systems and structures that more of us could do this work. And this is the, this exact type of work so that we can be involved in having these converse, conversations and moving uh, care delivery forward that's consistent with patient goals. So with that, I think that my slides are, are done and I'll hand it back to Jan and Emily. Thanks, Steve. I might also just add one here. Um, the primary care provider should be at the, the core of how these seriously ill patients are managed. And you probably see this as much as those of us who practice primary care. 
in that our patients need to be hearing consistent messages um, from everyone involved in their care. And so having the consultants engaged, not only in understanding the goals, but in helping assess prognosis, helping communicate prognosis that isn't just relevant maybe to what's going on with their heart, because they are, regardless, they're still that whole person in front of us, right, is really important. You probably have had barriers in providing this type of care consistently every time for every patient. And my guess is that they're similar to what other providers have told us are their barriers. Time. We hear this is a time consuming process and conversation. And this is one of those areas where when we say our health system tolerates it, this is one of those things, time. We're not structured to have time to do this consistently well. And it's one of those things we need to really think about as doctors, does this matter to us to have the time to do this? And, and how do we make the time and how do we make it consistent, consistent time to do this well? Understanding about prognosis and fear of dashing hopes. So providers say, well, I don't know what the prognosis is. Can I talk to my patient if I'm really not that certain about what the prognosis is? And then fear of dashing hopes. My patient will give up. They'll think I've given up on them. Um, and of course, none of us want our patients to think we've given up on them. And fortunately, what we see is that when you actually have these conversations and you do it well, your patients don't feel like, they're, like you're giving up on them. They feel like you're focusing on them, and they feel like they're not alone. We hear a lot our patients feel alone when they feel their body's failing, and they don't feel heard, um, or that, that, that failing reflected back to them. And then we hear our providers say they haven't been trained to do this to have these conversations, which is true. 68% of providers have not been trained in these conversations. And if you're like me, I didn't get trained to have these conversations as a medical student. The only reason I was trained to have these as a resident was because I found great palliative care doctors and I took a palliative care rotation as my first rotation as a resident. And that shaped the rest of my medical career. Our medical system, it does default still to aggressive care. We've made a lot of changes around this. Um, and, and aggressive care is, is perfect in the right circumstance, right? We have incredible life-saving therapies that we want to use and we want to do at the right times. And sometimes, but sometimes we're using those when they aren't the, effect, the most effective solution for our patients still. And our patients, they do have a fighter mentality sometimes, and we hear that. And that those ones are really difficult conversations. Um, and then we also hear, uh, our patients say, well, you know, my primary care doctor is telling me this, but I really care about what my specialist says, my pulmonologist, my oncologist, and we may not have all the same perspective. So the serious illness care program is communication tools, training programs, and then system changes in, um, in the, especially in the electronic medical record to help us identify prognosis, discuss goals of care, and document those goals of care um, in, a, in the record uh, consistently. The vision for our program is that we will use data to recognize our patients sooner, that we will provide timely and accurate information to our patients about their prognosis and options for treatment, understand, document, and act on, our, on those care goals for our patients in light of their illness, and to connect our patients with care programs that best support their goals. Those include things like palliative care in the community, um, hospice, if those are in line with their, the, our patient's goals of care. We can move into talking a little bit more about prognostication. If, uh, again, if you're like me, prognostication is confusing. And a lot of times people talk about these tools, and they're very disease specific tools. And one of the things that you're taught uh, very early on in geriatrics is that often the disease-specific uh, prognosis isn't what's really the most important. It's not taking into consideration that whole picture. And our patients have multi-morbid conditions usually. So usually these patients don't just have heart failure. They've got many other things going on. Um, and you can use functional status to actually help with understanding the patient's prognosis. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about functional status prognostication. The other thing I'll just say is that patients, uh, when you start talking about functional status, it's the stuff that patients wanna tell you about. 
So they want to tell you about the fact that they are tired all the time. They want to tell you about the fact that, or their wife wants to tell you about the fact that they're sleeping and napping um, more. And why is that? And so these are all really valuable, useful pieces of information that we're not inherently taught to think about in terms of prognostication. Steve was referencing this uh, when, when we think about physical decline. Um, and we all are taught about cancer, and we're all taught a little bit about the organ failure, which you guys are very familiar with, that there are these peaks and valleys. And then at the bottom, you see this physical and cogn cognitive frailty. And a lot of our multi-morbid patients have some combination of these two, which makes it really unclear. But what we know is that the trajectory is slowly moving this way. And sometimes we don't stop and even tell our patients that and have that conversation with them. So when we communicate prognostication, even if we don't know exactly how long, and we'll hear this in the guide, just saying things may not get better. Things are likely to progress and get worse. Our patients appreciate that, and, and it doesn't take away hope, doesn't cause depression or anxiety, and it doesn't harm our relationship with our patient. And some evidence actually shows that it helps our patients with peace of mind and helps us align with our patients. All right, now that's kind of the gestalt version of prognostication. <laughs> this is the less gestalt version. This is the data-driven version of prognostication. So we've been working on um, an actual score that helps us identify patients who uh, have a high risk of mortality um, over the next year and also could benefit with uh, serious illness intervention or palliative care. We... We also know that uh, as we think about prognostication, we know that we overestimate prognosis. You guys have probably heard this as well, pretty consistently. And so in, in order to help us do this better, having a concrete data-driven methodology for doing that um, can be helpful. So we created this serious illness identification tool. And what it does is it looks at Actually, it's like 128 different elements um, that go into this. Looks at diagnosis factors. You can see here again, we're looking at how do we do prognostication better, especially in our multi-morbid complex patients that don't just have one specific illness. So it ac accounts for all of these different diagnoses. It also accounts for specific lab values, medications, has a patient been, uh, is the patient on oxygen? And then it takes into consideration utilization factors, such as, has this patient previously seen palliative care? How often have they used the hospital or the emergency room? It does not include anyone who's actively enrolled in hospice, because those patients, we feel like, probably don't need to be flagged for additional serious illness interventions. So what it does then is it puts patients into one of five categories with five being the most severe, uh, and five having a high likelihood of illness burden, high risk for prolonged ho or complex hospitalizations. And these category fives are likely also eligible for hospice. Um, and then the severity gets uh, less, the lower the number. This is actually a study that Steve helped us do on our serious illness filter showing the mortality rate of these different categories of patients, both at six months and a year. And you can see that uh, for our category five patients, they have a prognosis at a year of around 40%. So pretty substantially high. And if we probably continued to look at the two-year prognosis, it would be even higher. So these category fives are where we're really focusing just a couple, so you can pull this into your patient list. It's pretty easy to find in, in the medical record, and we have some tip sheets that we can send out around that too. There are a couple just caveats. So it only uses the Alina's EMR data. If the patient that you're seeing cares, is, receives their care predominantly outside of Alina, 
they may not have a score, or they may generate a score that maybe isn't consistent with your clinical assessment. And just to point out, this does not replace clinical judgment. This is supposed to be a supplement. And we built it to be very specific and not sensitive. So if there is a five there, it's probably right. If there isn't a five there, it doesn't mean your patient isn't seriously ill. It just means that there isn't enough data, either from our EMR, uh, to, support, to support an actual score. All right, I'm gonna hand it over to Jan. And I'll, I'll add just one more thing about, I guess, identifying patients. An incredibly useful tool, other than the filter, is the surprise question. Is this on? Um, which maybe some of you have heard of before, but um, I found it made a difference for me. Would I be surprised if my patient died in the next year? If my answer is no, it's time for me to be talking to my patient about what I can see is ahead for them and what they want. I think without asking that question in the clinic, I think I subconsciously would always say to myself, well, it's not time. They're nowhere near, they're nowhere near needing anything, in the, anything end of life. But the surprise question is, is a universally agreed upon um, helpful identification tool. Okay, just, we're, we're gonna very briefly show you what this guide is and actually show you a short video that demonstrates a conversation. This guide was developed at Ariadne Labs. The executive director of Ariadne Labs was Dr. Atul Gawande, who many of you probably know. He's a surgeon, a writer. Um, some of you may have read Being Mortal, which is an amazing book I recommend to all of you. But much, <coughs> excuse me, much earlier, in 1990, he was part of an international group of surgeons who developed the surgery checklist, and he wrote the, the checklist manifesto. He used some of the same principles that they used for the surgery checklist in thinking about how do we talk to patients about their wishes. Um, and uh, so like the surgery checklist, even though the guide is by no means a checklist, it helps, as it says here, ensure completion of necessary tasks during complex, stressful situations. Man, oh man, having that guide in front of me, it, it lowers my anxiety and it lowers the patient's anxiety. Um, it was developed over four or five years with tons of focus groups by Ariadne and it's now used worldwide. And it's the basis for the documentation in the chart now, which is just a reflection of the fact that it's pretty widely accepted. It is in fact an effective and an efficient tool. They crafted the word, the every question, the wording of the question, the sequencing of the questions are carefully designed to foster alignment with our patients and to signal to our patients, we are not, this is, there's nothing, this is not urgent today. We don't need to make any decisions today. We are not signaling the end of treatment. Um, we're here to explore with you. So overall arc of the conversation probably is gonna look very familiar. We know that all of you are having these conversations. Um, I think we all were. It's just that this guy really can really make it easier. Set up the conversation and, and, and explain the rationale. We're gonna, we're gonna step back from what we normally do. You know, my post-hospital follow-ups from a CHF exacerbation, okay, what's your potassium? Let me look at your ankles. Let's see if your blood pressure's okay. Great, I'll see you in three months. That, that was my post-hospital visit. And that changed for me. It's like, let's schedule a separate appointment in the clinic, I would say, to step back and look at the big picture here. Number two, assess their understanding of where they are with their illness. Number three, actually take the it, it time to intentionally share prognosis and then to move on to explore their goals and priorities in light of that prognosis and begin to, by the questions we ask, to begin to signal to them that the time is likely to come when they actually have to choose between trade-offs. And then finally to close with recommendation. So now, John's gonna help me if I mess up. Hit, hit escape, thank you. Thank you. This is a 10 minute video produced by Ariadne Labs.
Mr. Jackson is a 68-year-old retired married salesperson with advanced chronic obstructive pulmonary disease on oxygen and steroids, type 2 diabetes, chronic kidney disease, and chronic hip pain. He has had three hospitalizations this year, multiple stays in subacute rehab, and two ER visits. He has been experiencing worsening shortness of breath, increasing fatigue and weakness, worsening functional status, and a 10-pound weight loss. He is scheduled for a telehealth visit following a recent hospitalization. Mr. Jackson will be seeing Dr. Fromey, his primary care physician. Today, Dr. Fromey has planned to have a serious illness conversation with Mr. Jackson. Mr. Jackson was informed in advance that part of the focus of this visit would be to talk about Mr. Jackson's goals and priorities. Dr. Fromey's goals for this conversation are to ensure that Mr. Jackson understands what may be ahead in the setting of his existing medical conditions, and to explore Mr. Jackson's goals, values, and preferences for care in the future. To do so, he's going to use the Serious Illness Conversation Guide. Let's take a look at Dr. Fromey's conversation with Mr. Jackson. Hi, Mr. Jackson. Uh, it's it's good to see you uh, virtually like this. How, yeah. how are you? How are you feeling? Hi. Oh, uh, uh, you know, I've been I've been better, but I'm feeling good. If you know, like yeah, I'm out of hospital, and so that's good. Yeah. So overall, I'm doing all right. A amen. Well, uh, and then how was it being in the hospital uh, this last time? I didn't like it. Uh, I just didn't like being there. You know, people are fine, doctors, nurses. Yeah, but I'm not complaining too much. <laughs> That's fair. Well, um, listen, I'd like to talk about what is ahead with your illness uh, and have us do some thinking in advance about what's important to you so that I can make sure that we provide you with the care you want. Would that be okay? Oh, my, let's see. <laughs> um, could we maybe wait on that? <laughs> a little, you know, maybe a little later. <laughs> okay. We could. I, I would like to talk about it today. I'm, I am trying to do this with all my patients, and I like to try to do it at a time when they're actually feeling better, uh, And because uh, it's hard to have these conversations, uh, you know, when you're feeling really sick. Right, right, right. That makes, that makes sense. Okay. All right. Thanks. Well, so my first question is, is what is your understanding now of where you are with your illness? Well, I have bad lungs, and they're not going to get better. I just hope they stay the same, maybe, <laughs> but that's what I got. I got bad lungs. Yeah, fair enough. Well, how much information about what is likely to be ahead with your illness would you like from me? Everything. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Well, then I want to share with you my understanding of where things are with your illness, uh, I'll say it can be difficult to predict what's going to happen with lung disease. Um, I hope that you will continue to live well uh, for a long time. Like, that's the goal. Uh, but I, I'm also worried that you could get really sick really quickly. Uh, and I think it's important to prepare for that possibility. Oh, man. You mean like... Um... You, you, you're talking about if I, you know, if it gets worse and stuff, huh? Yeah. Oh, brother. Wow. You know, this is this is hard to to think about and hard to talk about it. Yeah. But but we got to do what we got to do. <laughs> we got to got to talk about it, talk about it. So okay, I'm game. All right. Well, I I appreciate that. Um, what are your most important goals if your health situation worsens? What do you, what do you mean? Like, uh, well, uh, for example, um, for some people, uh, their work is their most important thing. Oh yeah. 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 Uh, uh, my family, mm -hmm. my family. Yep. Uh, if I had to say, I guess, uh, number one goal See my grandson gra graduate from high school. He's supposed to graduate next year. Oh, that's that's wonderful. Yeah. Wow. That's he's a good one. Yeah. He's a good one. good boy. Yeah. Yes. So that's exactly what I'm, I'm looking for. Well, 
And then what, what are your biggest fears and worries about the future with your health? Uh, having my wife see me suffer. I've been thinking about that a lot. Hmm. And uh, I'm not looking forward to suffocating. <laughs> you know? All right. Yeah. That's fair. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, you know, uh, it, you're, it's great you still have your sense of humor. I would like to come back to that uh, uh, subject later because I think there's a lot of things that we can do uh, to put a plan in place to really help uh, prevent you from, from feeling like you're suffocating. But yeah. do you mind if we uh, kind of finish this line of questions first? Sure, that's fine. Okay, great. What gives you strength as you think about the future with your illness? I look to God as I lead my life. I'm not a big churcher, but I do look to God and that helps that me. Sounds like it hmm. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, sorry. that's, that's wonderful. Okay. Well, you can and then get it to you. what abilities are so critical to your life that you can't imagine living without them? Like, like, like what? Like, uh, well, a, a, a mentor of mine, uh, her father told her that as long as he could sit in his easy chair, watch football on TV and eat chocolate ice cream, then he was good. <laughs> Yeah, I like that. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, I, I would like to be able to take care of myself. I mean, physically take care of myself, hmm. you know? Yeah. Uh, by myself, like a bathroom and wash myself and stuff. That's, that's a big thing for me. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Well, if you became sicker, how much are you willing to go through for the possibility of gaining more time? Oh, you mean like uh, what, what kind of medical stuff I would be willing to? Yeah, for have. example. Yeah, right. Uh, well, that's a tough one because a couple of times ago, as you know, I was in the ICU and I, I don't know that I want to go through that again. Hmm. But at the same time, you know, uh, you know, I, I got out of it, so I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. That's a tough, t tough one to answer. Yeah. Well, it, actually, just me hearing that you, you've had that experience and you're a little bit on the fence now uh, is really helpful. I, I, I don't think we have to make a decision about that today, but it's really helpful for me to know uh, that about you. Okay, good. Good. How much does your family know? Uh, about your priorities and wishes, the stuff we've been talking about? You know, that's a good question. I, uh, I've i tried not to, you know, upset my wife, and even my kids, they're adults at all, you know, but uh, I don't want them to worry too much, so I haven't really talked about it with them. Hmm. Yeah. Well... Let me see, uh, let me try and summarize what I heard you say, and you can correct me if I uh, get something not quite right, but um, what I heard you say was really the important things for you are, are your family, seeing your grandson uh, graduate from high school, not seeing your wife see you suffer, uh, that it's important for you to feel like you can take uh, care of yourself physically. Uh, and that you've had this experience of being in the ICU and, and are not decided yet maybe about whether you'd want to go through that again. Yeah. I think keeping all that in mind uh, and what we know about your illness, I'd recommend that we have another one of these conversations and maybe bring your wife into the loop. Uh, what I'm thinking is one way that we can make this easier for her and both of you is really uh, to have her hear kind of what's important to you uh, and what the plan is so that when things happen, she doesn't panic. Uh, and I think that'll really help us make sure that your treatment plans reflect what is important to you also. Mm. How does that plan seem to you? You know, that makes sense to me, doctor. I think it might help her. I, I, I think she would like that. Good, good. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. I want you to know I'll do everything I can uh, to help you through this. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, you're welcome. So uh, I'd like to come back to.
Oh, I'm sorry, the immediate reactions. I'd just like to point out that, yes, it, it was a fairly perfunctory conversation, but that was 10 minutes. It wasn't two hours. Um, I'm going to run through these quickly um, so that we have a few minutes for conversation. Um, but um, I, the heading here says pitfalls in communicating with patients with advanced heart disease. This goes for any, pa any one of our patients, any one of us. Um, but I think as physicians, we were really good at just sort of talking through and maybe having some vague sense that there might be some emotion in front of us, but really pretty much just ignoring that. When we ignore emotion in these conversations, um, the patient hears nothing else that we're saying. Um, we often skip over what patients' values are to just get to, to making that decision. Um, I think it's pretty natural for all of us to avoid discussions about dying or a treatment failing. Um, I think it's very, it's, it's a human, human nature to want to focus sometimes on the um, extreme outliers of survival benefit, omit the d downsides of a procedure, um, or to actually offer as an option um, to stop treatment. Shifting gears now, um, and I'll fly through this. We'll send out a handout so that um, you have this um, available. But to document a conversation, it's done now in the new ACP Navigator in what's called a smart form. All the questions on the guide are right there. Um, you also document it in the progress note by just using the smart phrase, and that pulls in every answer that's on the smart form. I don't know if you've all seen the ACP Navigator or not but you get to it by clicking on code on that storyboard on the, on the left-hand side of the chart. And when you click on that, up comes the ACP Navigator. And there, everything relating to a patient's end-of-life wishes is to be housed there. Documents, healthcare directives, polls, as well as the conversation. And to get to the conversation, you would click on serious illness and then illness conversation, and up comes this smart form template with blue boxes where you can check patient answers. I much prefer using the comment section to free text as close as I can what the patient actually told me. That gets summarized, as you, as, as you can see in the above part of that slide, and then the, those conversations are tracked over time. There are two billing codes for billing for this conversation. Um, those are RVUs. Are RVUs universal? I don't know. Yeah, okay. So there they are. <laughs> um, for the first 16 minutes of a 30-minute conversation, you would use the first code, and then for each additional 30 minutes, the second code. We just wanted to make you aware that we've been training um, physicians and nurse practitioners, as well as RNs and social workers now for several years. Um, it is a four-hour class um, that's done in really small groups so that there's um, the, the opportunity for dialogue as well as the opportunity for role play, which is what most of the folks who go through it find by far the most valuable, just an, an opportunity to practice and gain confidence in using the guide. Um, I leave you with a quote from Dr. Gawande. We've been wrong about what our job is in medicine. We think our job is to ensure health and survival. But really, it is larger than that. It is to enable well-being. And well-being is about the reasons one wishes to be alive. And with that, I thank you. Um, this is my email address, as well as our, part, our colleague, Dr. Glenn Varnes, who's the Director of Hospice and Palliative Care. Um, would love to hear from you. H happy to help in any way I can, and you know, as you begin this work. And with that, I once again want to really thank you for um, inviting us here this morning and to be with all of you. And with that, um, we, Emily and I, Dr. Downing and I would be happy to um, answer any questions you might have about this. Thanks for that um, very much. I think. One of the challenges I run into as I think about um, 
having this conversation with the patient is getting to a place where I need resources that I don't know where to get them. So a patient who uh, has a serious illness, I have a conversation, they make it clear that their goals of care are to avoid further hospitalizations, to avoid further invasive procedures, and that they really want to focus on comfort just being at home. And, and then I'm in a spot where I need to figure out how do I facilitate that? And I don't have a clue even when I'm in my most frequent clinic and far further when I'm in an outreach clinic out, you know, far from the city. So would love your thoughts and guidance about, you know, it's one thing to have the conversation, but when you get to a point where you want to move it forward in terms of enacting the, the goals and what's been outlined by the patient, how do we facilitate that? I'm going to turn to my colleague. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, <clears throat> the easiest the easiest thing to do is to make a referral to palliative care. Um, and we have the ability to navigate then when we get that referral, what the best treat, like what the best support program would be for that patient. Certainly we would love for you to be more familiar with hospice and when and how to refer to hospice. That's kind of a second phase of some of this too but the palliative care route is probably the easiest. Now, are there gaps in palliative care? There are some gaps, but in the, especially in the ambulatory setting, we have a community palliative care program um, that is a nurse, a chaplain, um, and a social worker, and a nurse practitioner that can go see the patient. We also have clinic-based palliative care, and our team on the receiving end will help figure out with, like, what the patient qualifies for and get them plugged in. So we're, we have heard this from many, uh, many other providers, um, and that's what, that's what we, we recommend. So you don't have to even know, but you would probably need to be able to tell the patient that someone's going to call them to talk to them about what their options are, um, and, and we can help with, you know, some education, some further education about that. Scott has a question. I'll take your mic over to Scott. Well, that, first of all, I'd like to thank you, all three of you, for shining a light on this really important topic. And, um, I do believe it's important, but I, as I see it, it's so challenging because, you know, the video that you showed, which was, the actor was wonderful, by the way, <laughs> looked like he did have severe COPD, but um, there was a relationship there between those two individuals, and our system does not uh, promote that. And... Um, you know, I'm thinking I'm hospital rounds when I have a panel of 25 patients and I'm not even going to see that patient again. And I'm trying to have a, a serious conversation and that's the last time that person may ever see me. And I'd like your perspective on how we tackle that problem. That's an excellent question. And we hear that all the time. Probably the, the largest group of physicians that we've been treating so far are hospitalists. They ask us that question all the time. It's a reality. Um, but also, it's also a reality that the hospital stay or the moment when they're in the hospital and you're caring for them is an incredible inflection point in their life, in their care. And I just don't think that that should stop you. Um, I think you might be surprised. Um, I think the patient and their family may actually thank you for, for, you know, for the first time um, voicing what they've known for months and being direct with them about you know, the elephant in the room. But I, I, I certainly appreciate what you're saying and your concern. Emily, do you have anything to add to that? You know, it, I would just second that, that it's the first time you're meeting a patient isn't always the wrong time to have a serious illness conversation. Um, I've had many conversations with patients where that's the only time I've met them, and I don't even really know what happened after that, um, except that at that moment, that was the most important thing to talk to that patient about. And if they seemed ready, especially if, you know, sometimes you walk in, and you hear that the patient and the family are confused and frustrated and don't understand what's going on. And they might even say, you know, I just can't believe I'm, you know, I'm going through this again. Or I just can't believe this is, you know, 
some of these things that that they that are kind of like they're they're almost they're welcoming phrases for let's have a conversation um, and 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 I also hear from families that they that have gone through situations with their loved ones in the emergency room, for example, where the emergency room physician didn't say anything, the admitting hospitalist didn't say anything. And now it's six days into the hospitalization and every, every provider is a new provider. And they wonder, as their loved one is, you know, maybe even actively dying, why did it take so long for someone to say something? Um, and, I, I, and I say, I don't know. I, I don't know. It looks like your loved one was very, very ill when they entered the emergency room. And now it's five days later. So... It's a really good question, and it's a really hard answer, and it, it often is the right thing to do. But when you have 25 patients on your schedule for the day, it's really hard to do, too. Our emergency room, the emergency room physicians who serve um, Abbott and, and United asked for this training, and we introduced this to them this summer in July. Um, and Dr. Sarah Friedman really believes that there is a place for these conversations in the ER. The, the, the trajectory gets set in the ER. And, and what happens in the ER gets continued in the ICU. And, and don't, don't forget, you know, you're, you're the specialist coming in. You're the, you're the voice of authority and the expert. And it could be there are times when that patient, well, is going to be, is going to be looking to you for, for the truth. Right? Other questions? That was a really long answer. <laughs> So there's just one online question thus far, and it's, can you please remind everyone where the serious illness conversation template is located in Excellian? Yes. So first of all, the um, that template that I showed you is in the ACP Navigator, which you get by clicking on code in the storyboard, and it will, it will pop up there when you click on serious illness conversation. We can send out a tip sheet. Maya, I think you could post. Also, I didn't think to bring the guide itself, which which um, we'll post with the video. We can post it on the Grand Rounds um, webpage that will be linked to this conversation. Thank you. I have a question. Is there a patient version of this? In other words, you know, ideally, if you're sitting in the hospital and you're, it's almost like a little journal, you know, or a mini version of the book. But, you know, if there was a patient version where they could, you know, because the it was hard for that guy to think on the spot. You know, those were, yeah, yeah. You know, he produced legit. Oh, I'm glad answers. you. Yeah. But you know, if you think about this, this is needs some pondering, and it could be something that the patient with their spouse could absolutely. I'm so glad you brought that up. So we'll share those resources as well. Ariadne produced two patient pieces, and one is titled Talking with Your Clinician About the Future. And it's in patient language. It's reflecting a lot of this, and basically the questions that are in the guide, but helping them to begin to think. And in the clinic, what we do is when we're setting up, we have this luxury that you don't have, but we, we set up an appointment ahead of time. The RN explains to the patient why Dr. Richardson was is proposing this special visit. And then the RN sends out this discussion guide. There's also another one titled, and it's even a little bit more of a workbook, but several pages, talking with your caregivers about what's most important. Yeah, those are available on the AKN, but we'll for sure, sh we can share them with you. Okay, was, uh, that would be, a, I think that's a fantastic resource, I think. Um, you know, along the idea of engaging patients, empowering them to be active in their care delivery, uh, there's recent work in, in heart failure space that shows by informing a patient why they're on medications, what medications we're trying to achieve, what goals, and that helps them think about what things they want to ask about at the next visit in terms of how they're going to titrate their medications. In a similar way, priming the patient to say, boy, I really don't understand what my trajectory looks like and, 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 have, and helping them to engage us to engage in these these conversations, I think would be fantastic. Both, I mean, there's a lot of time where patients are sitting in the hospital waiting and thinking about when's the next time they're going to see the doc, and and engaging patients in those opportunities to 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 think through and, and have them 
think about what questions they want to ask yeah. so they can understand yeah. those things. Because um, sometimes I think that they assume that we're going to provide them answers to the questions, but they may not think to, to kind of have those questions in hand. Yeah. I think of this conversation as being incredibly empowering for the patient and their family. Merely asking patients these questions, they may well not have all the answers. You know, like, what? What are you willing to go through for gaining more time? Well, you know, they have made no idea how to answer that question the first time, but they've heard it once, and they're going to be thinking about it. And the next time, they may be a little bit more prepared. What abilities are you not willing, you know, to live without? You know, I don't know. It's an empowering conversation. And the one last thing I would say is, um, as I've shared this with my my colleagues, my friends, my family. Almost invariably, you know, the person I'm talking to thinks of a loved one that they've gone through an experience, you know, of death and dying with a loved one. And almost invariably, the person says, you know, I just wish we had known. I wish we had had more time. And in some ways, I think that's one of the biggest gifts of this of all, um, is to give patients and their families the time to, to spend, spend their days living until death. Question. Just a couple more online questions. Um, so the first one's actually more of a comment that could lead to a good discussion. But for some patients, uh, the patients often defer to their family. And sometimes family conflict can put uh, doctors in the middle. Have you dealt with that situation? And how do you have any tips for navigating that situation? Absolutely. And I think that's another power of this conversation. This conversation, I, I always invite one or two family members, you know, key decision makers over to come to the appointment. You would hopefully have a family member sitting in the room with you in the hospital, or perhaps even the clinic. It's made very clear to the family member that they are there to listen. And it was amazing how often, you know, family members um, thanked me afterwards for the conversation. A 95-year-old couple came in, and, and the wife said afterwards, I learned things about my husband that I never knew in the last half an hour. Um, does that get rid of all conflict? No. But you can start by having the, patient, the, having the family listen to their loved one. And sometimes that loved one, that patient, will say things to you that they haven't quite had the courage to say to their family about what their goals and priorities are. I'd just add that um, those are the ones that are for sure the most challenging. And going through this, you get some training, you know, some of the support that we can provide is support for how to mediate in those types of conversations, because there is a definite need to redirect often in a conversation. Um, back to the goals of the patient and recognizing that some of these things you're talking about are just really messy where, you know, there are patients living in his family members living in different places. They have different perspectives. Um, but uh, when you start doing it more consistently, similar to like when you see a palliative care provider at your family conference, you start doing it more consistently, you get a little better at it. Um, so there's just two more questions, if we have time for that, that that'd be great. Um, we can go through these quickly here. Um, so along those same lines, uh, do you tend to do these conversations in just one visit, or it, is there any times that where you, they come back, be, just because these conversations can be overwhelming? So is do you typically do this in one visit, or is it kind of a multi-step process? I typically do it in one visit, but that being said, it could be that it could be that it'll be part of the conversation. And, and that just highlights the important point to make, which is this is not a one-time conversation. This, this is going to be many, many conversations over months. Um, but no, it all depends. Maybe you get so far in the conversation and that's all that, all that the patient wants at that point. Thank you. So the last question is just about perhaps uh, language barriers. You know, you had shared that resource that was in English, perhaps, you know, some complicated language in there. Is there other languages that these documents are available in? And do you have any translators 
that have been trained in these conversations? That is an excellent question. And I think one of the things our program needs to do is to gather some interpreters who can really have a better understanding of what this conversation is. Um, the guide is available in a number of languages, but unfortunately not Hmong or Somali at this point, um, for instance. Um, and and that's a very that's an excellent question. But we always make the point in the training that if you're going to be working with an interpreter, this is one time when you pull that interpreter aside before you go in the room and try to explain what this conversation is about and that this is going to be very, very different. With that, I'll, I think we'll close. Thanks so much to Dr. Richardson and Dr. Downing for being with us this morning, and thank you all. Have a good rest of your day.